temple. The engraving provides a complex visual and textual icon of Confucius. The publication of the Confucius Sinarum Philosophus established the image of Confucius as the philosopher upon whose teaching the ancient, enlightened empire of China was founded, thus contributing to European philosophical ideals through the appropriation and interpretations rather, of the great sage and his thought. <coughs> Almost one century later, Bertin announced in the preface to volume one of the Mémoire Concernant les Chinois, published in 1776, that he had, as he referred to them, portraits or brief lives of famous Chinese figures throughout history, which had been prepared by Father Joseph Marie Amiot. The first selection of some 52 of these biographies were published in volume three of the memoir in 1778. And the short biography of Confucius was illustrated by the engraving we see here. The biography emphasizes his efforts to bring virtue and good morals to the various kingdoms of ancient China. It describes what were traditionally believed to be Confucius compilations or commentaries <coughs> on classical texts. And it tells of the role of his many disciples in compiling the great learning, the doctrine of the mean, and the analects. <coughs> Two footnotes in this biography refer the reader to volume one, where translations of the great learning, the Dashu, and the doctrine of the mean, the Zhongnong, had already been published. However, the biography itself is very brief, just two pages long, and contains only the bare outline of Confucius' life and career. But it ends with a statement from Emmanuel, who was one of Bertin's most prolific correspondents, that he will provide a biography of this sage in greater detail. Confucius' portrait is one of only six illustrations to accompany the short biography in volume three of the memoir and the engravings here closely follow the format and details of the original Chinese paintings. The source, for the, portrait of the source for the portrait of Confucius is the painting we see here, the work of an anonymous Chinese artist. It is inscribed in Amio's distinctive handwriting, Kongzi Confucius, with the number 22, and the Chinese character is Kongzi. This small painting on paper is now detached from the album in which it was originally included, but it has an interesting history Amiel had obtained a Chinese album that contained mostly bust-length portraits of famous historical figures facing short biogra biographical texts in Chinese. That album, dated to 1685, was intended by Amiel to be presented to the Bibliothèque du Roi, the French Royal Library. But Amiel realized that the subjects would be of great interest to Bertin, so he wrote in October of 1771 that he was sending a set of copies of the paintings from the 1685 album those copies, now bound in 10 volumes, contain painted portraits and Amiot's own biographies. And they are the source of the publications in the Memoir Consonant et Chinois. Details of the costume and the pose identify this painting as a portrait of Confucius as a minister of justice in the ancient state of Lu. In a letter dated 26 July 1780, Amio repeats his promise that he would send a complete life of Confucius, but he admits that such a history has required a great deal of time, since the information is scattered across many different books and thus hard to assemble. The biography, however, will show Confucius not as Europeans have portrayed him, but as he is seen in China and depicted in his own writings, an assertion Amio makes a number of times in the final text. In addition, Amio has put together more than 100 plates Planche, that's how he refers to them, drawn by one of the most skillful artists in Beijing based on illustrations from the most authentic sources. Convinced that such an album will find a place of honor in Bertin's collection, Amiel also says that he is sending all the portraits of Confucius at the head of the prince that will accompany his history. These will represent the principal events of the philosopher's life. Um, here, we are looking at the portrait of Confucius and the title page of Amiot's Vita Conce, which was finally published in volume 12 of the memoir in 1786. <coughs> in addition to the biography itself, the volume contains a chronological table of the events of Confucius' life, a detailed explanation of 18 engraved plates illustrating the text, and a series of genealogical tables of Confucius' family down through the 71st generation in 1784. In his explanation of this portrait, 
Amiel noted that it represents Confucius as he was displayed for the veneration of Chinese scholars. It seems that one of Confucius' descendants of the 47th generation had described how the Confucius temple in Chufu in Shandong possessed a small portrait known to show him as he actually appeared. Amiel stated that portraits of Confucius were only hung in academies beginning in the Eastern Han in the second century BC, and then goes on to narrate a history of the uses of the various portraits of the sage and those of his disciples, both as paintings and statues. Amiel's short history of portraits ends with a, discale, a detailed description of how, in 1530, the Ming Jiajing Emperor ordered the removal of all statues and paintings of Confucius from official temples. The images of his disciples had already been replaced by inscribed tablets. Although Emil repeated here his claim that he was only presenting the life of Confucius as the Chinese saw it, with no criticism on his part and only for the judgment of others, it is clear that the story of the images being replaced with inscribed tablets reflects the very strong prejudice against idols by the Jesuit missionaries in China. The portrait of Confucius at the beginning of the biography is engraved in a thoroughly European style, but the composition and details of the costume and throne carefully reproduce a woodcut image that ultimately dates to the early 16th century. A copy of this Chinese portrait was presumably among the portraits sent by, among the prints rather, sent by Hamyon. All of the other illustrations inserted in the text, however, translate their Chinese sources into a completely European style transforming and restructuring the landscape settings in the pictorial space. For just one example, the scene we are looking at here is plate number 15, facing page 379, and it shows Confucius receiving the blessings of heaven for having compiled the six classics. Amio's biography narrates the episode, and the commentary on the plates at the end of the volume gives a concise description of the scene. Confucius, kneeling before an altar with six books on it, thanks Shang Di, the supreme deity, for letting him live long enough to have completed the six classics. Heaven, as a sign of approval, sends down a ray of light shining in the books themselves, a scene that is witnessed by six of Confucius' disciples. In Amio's biography, the description of the scene is followed by what is supposed to be the direct translation of a long address given by Confucius to his disciples a few days later, when he assigned each of them a particular responsibility in the study of antiquity, morality, of elements in presenting his teachings and the like. Emil repeats his previous statement here, that he is presenting only what the Chinese had written in the form that they had written it, and leaving European readers to judge the life of Confucius according to their own perceptions and knowledge. With the description of Confucius himself, and the choice of, of text that Emil has included as translations are a clear statement of Confucian morality, and implicitly a lesson for European intellectuals and even for the rulers of China. Of China, excuse me, the rulers of nations. It was already a lesson in China, sure. Um, <coughs> the collection of some 100 plates that Amio had made for that time would have contained illustrations from an extended group of images that existed in many forms, as paintings and especially woodblock prints. These are given titles such as The Traces of the Sage Confucius, a series which ultimately dates to the end of the 15th century. The differences between the woodblock illustration we're looking at here and the version published in the memoir demonstrate the remarkable transformation of the image, although it is not clear exactly which woodcut version Amio had sent as a model. Confucius kneels at an altar, while his disciples stand behind the sage himself or hold the tablets, tables rather, with six books that represent the classics. He receives the approval of heaven in the form of a ray of light coming down from the constellation the Big Dipper. A ray of light that, according to the inscription, was then transformed into an inscribed yellow jade tablet. This particular episode is not recorded in Sima Chen's primary biography of Confucius in the first century BC Shiji, the records of the historian, but rather is based on a later apocryphal text. In the Avertissement, the introduction to volume 12 of the memoir, Bertin notes that the illustrations of the life of Confucius were engraved by an artist who was skillful enough to understand and render what is characteristic of them. 
This was because the artist had already worked for several years on drawings from China, of which he had successfully published several series. The illustrations that Bertin published were engraved by Isidore Stanislas Hellmann, who was indeed a skilled artist and a very successful publisher. Hellmann himself published a version of the life of Confucius in which he reused and added to the engravings originally produced for Bertin. We were again looking at the portrait of Confucius, plate number one, in Hellmann's Abrégé Historique, that is his historical synopsis of the principal events of the life of Confucius, which appeared soon after the publication of Amio's biography in the Memoir. Here, Hellman has added a citation from a poem by Voltaire, which appears in a short passage on Confucius, in which the French writer praises the sage's integrity. And I quote, I knew a philosopher who had only the portrait of Confucius on the wall of his private study, and below he had put these four lines. Interpreter, the soul abiding wisdom, enlightening the spirit without dazzling the world. He spoke only as a sage, never as a prophet, and still he was believed, and even in his own country. I have carefully read his books, and I have taken quotations from them. I have found there only the purest ethics, with no trace of fraud." End quote. The evocation of Voltaire surely added to the popular appeal of Hellman's publication which featured descriptions of the 24 engraved illustrations, descriptions which were then themselves taken from the text of a small volume on Confucius that had first appeared in 1782. Helmut's prints, based on Chinese sources, are kind of a cultural translation, very much a transformation of the Chinese images, which were recreated in European visual terms for the education of a European audience. And I would like to say that Paola de Mate, writing in English, and Zhao Yingli, writing in French, have both published important research on the meanings and implications of Hellman's illustrations and other Chinese images uh, published for Bertin. Bertin's life of Confucius in the memoir and Hellman's abrégé historique were surely among the most visible and widely circulated texts and images of Confucius in the late 18th century. At the time he was, uh, he was looking outward with the dissemination of information to an educated European public, Bertin was also turning inward to a much more personal vision, a much more personal project, rather, the construction of a chateau and gardens of Chateau, just west of Paris. In 1682, Bertin had acquired the domains and titles of Chateau and Montesson, and he soon began work on these holdings, which would include agricultural experiments. What we are looking at here is a painting depicting a two-story building. In the caption to this illustration, it is described as a type that would be built facing the gardens behind a grand palace or city residence, or in a maison de plaisance, a term for a garden retreat in the countryside. The painting is part of a two-album set that bears the title Essay sur l'architecture chinoise, the essay on Chinese architecture. And the combination of descriptive texts and highly detailed paintings of Chinese architecture is unprecedented. The two albums themselves are undated, but the manuscript that is the source for the text copied into them provides an approximate date. The last page notes that it was written in Beijing on 3 October 1773. While the paintings emphasize the depiction of architectural detail, each building is given at least a minimal landscape backdrop, and certain structures are depicted in more elaborate garden or landscape settings. <clears throat> in the first album of the Essay sur l'architecture chinoise, some 57 paintings depict buildings identified as cabinet chinois. In 18th century, 18th century French usage, the term cabinet can mean both a collector's studio or office, or in other contexts, a garden pavilion. These were, of course, typical and well-known constructions in Chinese gardens, and so-called Chinese pavilions were already a feature of European garden architecture. The text that introduces these paintings states, quote, we would have perhaps not had so many painted if we had not felt that one might be inclined to work in this style according to the designs of the Chinese or to refine them." End quote. For Bertin's project of a Chinese, uh, for a Chinese style building at Chateau, the kind of detail presented here would be of primary importance. This project would take many years. In a letter dated 17, January 1788, Bertin had already noted that Father François Bourgeois, the administrator of the French Jesuit mission in Beijing, had, quote, 
taken on having the Chinese style designs made for the embellishment of your gardens at Chateau. Before. A long, undated letter from Bertin to Bourgeois contained detailed descriptions and drawings of what he planned, asking that Bourgeois, that Bourgeois consult on these with, quote, Chinese architects, unquote. The letter ends with Bertin's note that he has many drawings of Chinese pavilions, no doubt a reference to the illustrations of the essay sur l'architecture chinoise, among others, which would serve as models. But he writes that if an architect in Beijing could provide a design, Bertin would gladly build that. Clearly, authenticity is paramount. In Amiot's letter of September 1788, the missionary praised Bertin's respect for the Chinese people and hoped that he would think from time to time of the one who would help make them known to Bertin as they are, that is, Amiot himself. And, he added that, when Bourgeois had obtained the designs from Chinese painters for what ornament Bertin's garden, he would also send to Bertin a plaque and a pair of inscriptions for his cabinet chinois, along with their explanations. In, on 16 October 1790, Bertin, uh, Amiot rather, wrote a long letter to Bertin fulfilling his promise to help in the arrangement of his cabinet chinois, his Chinese studio. The letter was accompanied by objects for Bertin's studio, as well as Amiot's drawing, which we see here, showing the arrangement of a name plaque for Bertin's studio, a couplet, on either side, and a table with implements for burning incense. Along with instructions on how to display and use these objects, Amio gave the meanings of all the Chinese inscriptions, which are written in standard script calligraphy on his drawing, beginning, beginning at the top with the character Fu, fortune or happiness, good fortune or happiness, of which Amio had sent three different examples. The four characters on the signboard, which read from right to left, uh, read Junza Buchi. And you know, translate this as a sage is not an instrument. The citation is from the Analects of Confucius, and it means that a true scholar is not a simple tool, but rather someone ready for all things. Emile also explains the sense of the couplet for Bertin. Starting with the first line at the right, in taking virtue as his guiding principle, the sage, by implication, effectively erects as many monuments to his own glory as there are mouths, that is, public praise, in the four corners of the world. The second line, on the left, implies that Ren, or benevolence, is the moving force behind the sage's actions. He will enjoy the rewards that he is due in personal contentment, a long life, and the esteem of the whole world. Through the choice of the Chinese texts, Amiot seeks to position Bertin himself as an equivalent of a Confucian sage or superior man. Amiot had begun his letter by saying that perhaps the best way to arrange Bertin's Chinese studio would be for Amiot to be transported there himself. But since this is not possible, he must do it in his imagination, and so finds himself, at least figuratively, in Bertin's company at Chateau. Here, he imagines Bertin with one of the classics in his hands, or the life of Confucius, the text Amiot himself had authored. Bertin would then reflect as a sage on the principles of things, on their brief existence, on their destruction and renewal in other forms, or on whatever point of history or morality he thought appropriate at the moment. Amiot then continues, imagining how the two of them would move through the Chinese building Bertin might have constructed, discussing and examining all the authentic details, including Chinese paintings and other objects Amio had sent from Beijing. <coughs> After much additional detail on how to enjoy the studio and gardens as a true Chinese scholar, Amio ends by saying that he has mentioned Bertin to the Channel Emperor, noting the esteem Bertin feels for the Chinese nation and how the emperor was grateful for this. The emperor too, apparently, had his own studio decorated as best as possible in the French style, or even practiced a little bit of the French language. Bertin surely envisioned his Chinese studio in Gardens at Chateau as somehow a true replica of a Chinese scholar's studio. But where Bertin actually built remains unclear. For the design of his relatively modest chateau, Bertin engaged Jacques Germain Soufflot, the most famous architect of his day. And Soufflot was also sometimes credited with the design of the gardens. At Soufflot's death in 1780, responsibility for the construction of Chateau apparently passed to his associate, Jean-Jacques Lecoeur. 
None of Soufflot's plans or drawings for the project seem to have survived, but at least three of Lecoeur's designs are held in the collections of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, including this design for a decorative sculpture crowning a Chinese pavilion. Carefully drawn, with indications of the final measurements, the design shows a figure seated cross-legged on a cushion holding a parasol decorated with bells. The figure itself seems to be a heavy-set woman with large breasts clearly visible under her robes and a long drooping mustache. <clears throat> Combining in pure chinoiserie style, vague and fantastic images of Buddhist figures with an erotically sensual oriental other.